Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Prasord and I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in central London in private practice. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Michael Schmidt, who has been in charge of a, a massive project called The Novel, a Biography. And uh, Michael Schmidt is Professor of Poetry at Glasgow University and a writer in residence at St John's College, Cambridge. He is founder and editorial and managing director of Carcanet Press and editor of PN Review. So, Michael, let me start by asking you this book, um, the novel, a biography. Um, why did you uh, undertake this massive project? I think I, I've always been a lover of poetry. I've never really liked the novel very much, and so I decided it was time I, now that I'm nearing retirement from, from teaching novels, I thought I should find out a bit about them. Uh, so it was really to please myself. I don't think I, I was aware of how large the project was when I set out. I probably should have been, but um, having, having been a teacher for 40-odd years, um, I wasn't. So you didn't know how many novels there were? <laughs> Is that right? Well, I don't think anyone knows quite how many there are. I, I must deal with about a thousand novels in that book, but I think by, when I started to, to write it, I'd only read probably four or five hundred, so it was, a, it was biting off considerably more than I, I could comfortably chew or swallow. So you undertook this project in order to find out about novels, so what did you find out about <laughs> novels? I found out that there's no definition of what a novel is, that uh, a novel can be as short as 100 pages, it can be as long as 2,000 pages. Uh, it can be in a dozen different forms, it can be all done in dialogue, it can be done in letters, it can be done in one-line sentences, it can be done all sorts of different ways, it can be write, written entirely in monosyllables. So there are all sorts of wonderful things happen in the novel, and as soon as you say that this is a novel, you've excluded half of, half of literature. Um, also, it can be written in verse, which is amusing, or, and it can be written in graphic form, though I don't deal with a graphic novel. So is there anything that unifies all novels? Are they all telling a story? What, what's the commonality, if anything? I don't think they're telling a story, but I think most novels will have some sense of a narrator, a fictionalised narrator, so that we're being taken through the book by an intelligence, by a, a host who has some kind of relationship to us and to the story. Um, so it is this notion of a, of a narrative with a narrator embedded in it. I think that probably is about as close as I want to come to defining a novel, and even that is probably a bit too close. One of the really interesting things about this book, and it is a, is a gripping read, is um, the notion of the novel as something important. Why are novels important? Why should people who don't bother to read novels reconsider? <laughs> I think we all read novels one way or another, we just don't realise they're novels. I think what's exciting about the novel as a form is that it, um, it catches speech, uh, it catches period, and most great novelists, most good novelists, are also very inventive with language. So they're refreshing language, they're taking us away from cliché. Uh, and in terms of plotting as well, they give us lots of things where we expect we know the outcome, but they surprise us. So I think the novel is, is a language of surprise. It's also a, a language of location, location in time and place. So uh, I love both those aspects of it. But uh, the extra thing is what the novelist in his or her imagination adds. So that leads on in my mind to a, 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 maybe a, a question that's going to lead you to run screaming from the room. <laughs> but some novels are considered serious novels. They're considered important or good novels. And others are, are looked down upon, even if they are bestsellers. Um, as airport pulp fiction. Mm. So in your opinion, is there such a distinction? And what distinguishes a, a, a great novel, or, or a serious novel perhaps, compared to a novel that you would not re mm. carry with such high regard? Let's call it a great novel, because I don't think all great novels are serious. I think almost every great novel is funny. Uh, Moby Dick, when I came to reread it, I was staggered at how amusing the first half is. It's hilarious. It's laugh-out-loud hilarious in terms of the... Uh, the jokes that Melville is telling us about the whale and, and about himself, in a way. So I think what, I think what distinguishes them is that the, the pulp novel, if you like, the novel that appeals to the mass market, is often littered with cliché. And it is, it is, in a sense, rewarding us for what we already know, rewarding us with what we already know. Uh, and that's very reassuring to the reader and so on. But it doesn't, as it were, take us out of ourselves. So you buy a romance and you know where you're going with it. You know that it will end up comfortably in bed or comfortably somewhere else. Um, Whereas if you buy a, a, a novel by Philip Roth uh, or an, a novel by Saul Bellow, you don't actually know where you're going to end up. There's the element of adventure. So I think, I think the reader who, 
risks the good novels, the great novels, is going to be a reader who loves adventure. But some of these great novels are difficult, it seems, to someone like me, at least. Um, could you say anything that might encourage us to keep going as we wade through what it feels like a difficult but great novel? Mm. Well, I don't think you should plunge right into Finnegan's Wake, though Finnegan's <laughs> Wake is a wonderfully great novel, and it's very rewarding. And it's rewarding to people, I think, like yourself, because of what it does with language. Uh, I think the alertness of Joyce, who, was, who knew about Freud and everything, who, his alertness to language, and the way that language discloses, even when it doesn't doesn't seem to be disclosing, is really quite exciting. Um, but I think, that there, I think, I suppose you should proceed pari passu, pay, you know, step by step, and you should probably not plunge in at the, the deepest end. You can plunge in with great writers like Raymond Chandler, who is very, very arresting, very, very funny, um, and has great narrative pace, and he's always surprising as well. And you move that, that way, you probably move in from the present into the past as well. Because I think often there's a sense difficulty in the novels of the past because of the difference in pace. And I guess that's the main thing the book tries to do. It tries to persuade readers that what matters is being in the novel rather than finishing the novel. When you think about the fact that, say, in Dickens' time, the novel was published in installments, families sat around in the evening and read the installments, they were all heartbroken when a, when a great novel finished. You know, when they got to the end of Bleak House, they were, they, they were pleased that all, every, all the knots had been tied up at the end, but they were also very deprived of all their friends who had ceased to exist. The novel is a, was a space in which to exist, to have to extend yourself. It becomes a kind of parallel world. And I think most modern readers tend to read to finish the book, and I think that is a betrayal of the novel form. Your, your book is, is about how novels begin, the very first novels, and it takes them right through to the present day. So what is the overarching arc of the plot of the novel, would you say, <laughs> given that your, novel, your book, not novel, yeah. your book is about novels, but, but it takes them from the beginning to the present day? Well, very near the beginning, there were two great novels, both of them by foreigners. One was Cervantes's Don Quixote, Spaniard, and one was uh, Rabelais' French Gargantua and Pantagruel. And in a curious way, the novel hasn't gone anywhere since then. Uh, in a curious way, those two novels um, do everything that the novel later on does. They do them both. Uh, they do their things very, very well. Both of them are parodies. They're parodies of a previous literature. So Don Quixote is a parody of romantic literature, and hilariously funny it is, but also deeply moving because it talks about the way in which literature takes us away from reality rather than taking us into reality. So in a way, it's a, it is the kind of the swing, the, the swing hinge into the modern. And Rabelais, who's just unbelievably funny in terms of his linguistic invention uh, and in terms of his handling of time. And people like Faulkner, writing in the, in the 30s, would say, I reread uh, Don Quixote every year. And, you know, you renew yourself from those two fountainheads. Um, it, it's very hard to see that anyone has bettered those two great works, but a lot of people have done different things. I guess the main thing that emerges after them is realism. Uh, a... Many people will know a little bit about the Don Quixote novel. I'm not so sure they know so much about the Rabelais one. Could you say something about that one? Well, we are very lucky in English because a very a crazy and wonderful Scottish laird called uh, Urquhart uh, translated Rabelais very early on. And Rabelais is a, a, a crazy physician like yourself. <laughs> not that you're <laughs> thank, crazy. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he he would so he. he but he was, uh, he was also trained in religion, so he was, uh, uh, did both those things. And Rabelais um, wrote his Gargantua and Pantagruel. You know the word Gargantuan, for example. That comes from the character of Gargantua, this giant, this giant strangely uh, human giant who, who does all sorts of, of very strange things, which include defecation and urination and all sorts of things, very, very graphically. Swift, of course, picks this up from him when he's writing Gulliver. Um, but Urquhart translated him, and he translated him at a period when, just shortly after Shakespeare, I guess, where the language was very fresh. And the, Urquhart's translation uh, is one of the great works of English literature. It's been reissued by the Modern Library in a very usable, lovely edition with a ribbon, so you feel as though you're reading, you're reading scripture. Uh, and uh, it, it is wonderfully funny. Don't read it fast. Don't read it to finish it. Read it, maybe read a chapter here and there. Don't feel, the overall structure of, of Gargantua and Pantagruel isn't particularly important, I guess, uh, in, in my view, but it has these amazing battle scenes. And one of the battle scenes, of Rabelais having been a physician, somebody chops the head, the top of the head off somebody, and the action stops. 
and Rabelais looks into the skull and looks at the disposition of the contents of the skull in a very, in a very clinical way. It's, it's very, very brilliant. Then, then the action starts again. So you have this kind of arrest and then it's very vigorous. And you're, you're going along through this rollicking uh, series of narratives and suddenly there is a utopia presented and it, it lasts for about 40 or 50 pages and uh, it's very brilliant too. This complete change of tone. It's a hugely versatile, wonderful novel. So your book begins with the very first novels, or what might be called the very first novel. Could you say something about these early attempts at the novel? Well, most people, many people would argue that the novel did not begin in English or in England. Obviously it began in ancient times in, in Rome, in China, etc. But I begin with the first English narrator, Sir John Mandeville. Uh, he was not however, written by an English writer. He was written by an anonymous French writer. So the first English novel happens in French. So the first English narrator speaks French. I think this is quite, quite important because I think translation is very important. The, the, the connections between the English novel and novels abroad is a very pertinent one. And the reason I chose that novel, it's not really a novel, it's more of a travel book, really, is that it had an invented narrator who has different adventures. Things happen to him. He feels, he feels pain, he feels pleasure, he meets people, um, he engages with them, and so there is this sense of it, but, but it's not Sir John Mandeville, it was written by a Frenchman, etc. It begins by a, with a travel from, from uh, Europe to the Holy Land, and then he goes beyond the Holy Land. So he goes from, the, the, from a more or less mappable territory into a, an entirely imagine, imagined one, which he, he, feed, he feeds upon classical literature and classical fantasy, so a lot of the elements there are familiar from Roman literature. But it's, again, it's very much like Don Quixote, a derivative work. Now, I think what was really interesting about that is that, the, in a way, you can see some important elements that emerge in the very first novel, if this is the first novel, which is, first of all, it's about something people are curious about. They're curious about other lands, mm -hmm. so he, he feeds their and curiosity. The land, yes. Yes, because yes, yes. he kind of maintains he's been on this pilgrimage, mm -hmm. though, though we suspect some of these stories are not true. Yeah. Um, and so he, you know, he's, he's pandering to this public thirst for knowledge about distant, strange, exotic lands. And because they don't know, he makes a lot of stuff up, mm -hmm. which is almost certainly not true. Mm -hmm. So he, he exploits the fact they don't know. And I would like to argue, perhaps at the risk of um, being a bit provocative, that's what all novelists do. They take you into something you're curious about, but you don't, you're not an expert in, and they kind of tell you stuff. But some of which, because you're not an expert in, you're in no position to judge whether mm -hmm. it's true or not. Yes, I, that is an interesting idea. I, when you think about Joyce's Dublin, for example, in Ulysses, any Dublin or any Irish person who goes to Dublin can actually check the geography. That book is entirely accurate in terms of its geography. Uh, when I was reading The Adventures of Augie March, the action goes to Mexico, where I grew up, and it takes place, part of it takes place in what I take to be the town of Tasco, and part of it in a town I had a long convalescence in called Cuernavaca. And the detail is all precisely correct. The detail in Lowry's Under the Volcano of Cuernavaca is, and of Tepuzlan is entirely correct. So that, in a way, the imagination comes in the character rather than necessarily in the, uh, in the invention around it. You're quite right, though, with Mandeville. He is basically telling tall tales. Yeah. And so you start there, and then you go through um, uh, from, from these first novels right to the present day. What, what, what other changes do you observe as being important in, in the novel form? It, there are waves, if you like. Um, the, first, the first real wave, when I think um, the novel becomes acceptable and widely read, it ceases to be an aristocratic form and, and travels down amongst the, the, the middle classes and then down to the working classes, is when it becomes literalized. And then, like Mandeville, it pretends to be true. So Robinson Crusoe, though it's based on a true story uh, of Alexander Selkirk, is in fact a very embroidered story about, uh, and almost all of Defoe's novels pretend to be true. His name doesn't even appear on the title page. So this pretense of the original books, of course, this pretense to truth is what I think drew a lot of people into, into reading fiction. Um, another thing that happens is that detail becomes very important. So you have the very pure writing of somebody like Jane Austen, very refined, uh, socially specific, very much based in speech, in the speech of class and differentiation and so on. Uh, and then when you get to Sir Walter Scott, you have description, this incredibly lavish description. Um, and so you move from a, a rarefied kind of social, not rarefied in terms of, of accessibility, but just a, a, a social discourse, you know, um, into a much more 
<clears throat> circumstantial kind of narrative. And again, Scott is telling us about things that aren't necessarily familiar, so he's tracing historical periods, landscapes, and so on, so he's inventing a great deal. Now, it couldn't escape my attention as a psychiatrist reading this, that over and over again you see bits about novelists seeming to develop psychiatric problems, or, or, or mental illness, or at least psychological turmoil. Um, they seem a particularly troubled bunch, um, is my impression, <laughs> uh, reading the book. Not, not every novelist, but over and over again you see this thing come up. And um, there is a fair amount of academic psychiatric research on, on this question about do writers... Um, I think they, they refer to them as writers, not novelists, mm. have higher rates of mental illness than you should really expect, everything else held constant. And the general view is they do have higher rates of mental illness. So what are your thoughts about that? I think, uh, having written a book on the poets of a thousand pages, I think the poets do have lots of problems. Um, and, uh, but I think the novelists, on the whole, are much more sort of a saner lot. Um, they're sane, certainly, to begin with. They're often ambitious, but they're very sane to begin with when they have huge success early on, this can develop into real problems later on because they can't they can't reattain their their early their early heights. But no, I think that for the most part, some of the novelists you read, people like Fielding, uh, people like Scott himself, even despite his terrible financial difficulties, Jane Austen, though she was a spinster and all that, very very uh, they're very very clear headed. Um, a lot of them had physical illnesses. I mean, people like like. Um, Stevenson with his t tuberculosis and so on, but I'm thinking of crazy ones. I mean, a lot of them write crazy books, but... Well, Tolstoy, for example, was supposed to have quite bad depression, I thought. Yeah, depression, is that, is that mental illness? Um, uh, yeah, well, <laughs> some people would say if it's serious enough, yes. But don't you think if you look closely at the human condition, you're likely to be a little tiny bit downcast? Um, well, that, that's the whole point. In fact, Nancy Andreasen, a very famous American psychiatrist, um, wrote several research papers examining writers, modern writers, who attend famous university mm. writing courses and found vi very high rates of what she called affective disorder, mm. meaning people get a bit low or pretty low yeah. or very low. She thinks there's a link between low mood, depression, um, and, and writing. I think it depends on what you take as coming first. If you're Theodore Dreiser and you write Sister Carrie or you write An American Tragedy, I do not frankly see how... Dreiser could have maintained his sanity and written those books. They're very, they're, they're amazing books. And the suicide of a character in Sister Carrie is one of the most terrible suicides in, in fiction. Not because the man is mad, but because the man, ha man has despaired. And the despair is not, a psych is not a neurotic despair. It is a despair with life. Not, it's not, not from, as it were, from the inside out, it's from the outside in. Um, and I think a, a, you, you get this even, I guess, with Hemingway as well. You know, I think his suicide had a lot to do with despair with himself rather than anything else. But I guess we probably would differ as to what constitutes a, a mental illness. Um, but my view is that probably most novelists, uh, to write a big novel at all, to write a, a, you know, a, a coherent novel at all, have to be relatively sane. I can, I, can you think of any really crazy novelists? No, I, I agree with you that the... That to, the to sit down and create and edit and stay with the whole structured process, you can't be too, for want to use a non-technical word, unhinged. Yeah. And what's interesting about poets is that maybe the length of time it requires to write a great poem is so much shorter mm. that it, it permits a fair amount of psychological dysfunction to yeah. intervene. And by the way, um, the research literature does suggest that poets have much higher rates mm. of, of mental illness. And, and of poets, if you divide them into male and female poets, Female poets in particular have, seem to have an extremely high suicide mm. rate. And it's even referred to in the psychological literature as the Sylvia Plath syndrome. Uh -huh. So it's even got a, a title. Uh -huh. I, I can't think of any no I'm just trying to think. I'm sure I'm wrong not, not to be able to think of any novels. There are lots of novels about suicide. Yeah. But I'm trying to think of novelists who committed suicide. At but you said I'm Hemingway, right, but, for example. Yes, Hemingway, he was cleaning his gun. <laughs> well, there's some controversy about that, isn't it? I thought that his wife became concerned that he looked suicidal, so she hid the key to the gun cabinet, that's uh -huh. the way the story goes. Yes. And um, Hemingway was looking for the key, and she hid it. Mm -hmm. And then the cleaner found the key and uh -huh. um, moved the hopefully, key. Hopefully so, so Hemingway found yeah. it and then shot himself. I suppose you could call alcoholism a kind of suicide as well. I yes. people like that's a very like high rate of that. And so on. But uh, Larry was also a poet, so well, let's put him in the poet camp. Okay. Uh, but on the whole, I think even the most... I mean, people like Tolstoy, writing those enormous novels, or Dostoevsky, who must have had a, a difficult life, amazing that they, that they 
pull through, as it were. So your argument seems to be more that the stress of, of the process, the uncertainty of, the, of the, the career of a novelist, is really what might put them under pressure. Not that there has to be something dysfunctional to begin with that helps them create the art. I think that's true with modern novelists, <clears throat> especially. I mean, people like Fitzgerald and Hemingway, possibly people like Golding, um, because, because of the failure to reach that early success. And also this competition with oneself, which must be very, very destructive. Whereas somebody like George Eliot, was each, each novel was a completely new beginning, and somebody like James never really put down his pen or his dictaphone. <laughs> now, can, can novels be therapeutic? Can people benefit from reading a novel if they're down or, or despairing of the world? Can, is there a sense in which a novel, a good novel or a great novel, can rescue them? There is a thing called bibliotherapy now mm. in psychiatry, which advocates the notion that reading books um, can be therapeutic. Well, I think many of the 19th century novels set out specifically to do that. I mean, when you read a Dickens novel and all the, all the plot plots come to a satisfactory conclusion, the bad are punished, the good are rewarded. That must be very therapeutic, because you think, ah, the world is just. Um, or you have somebody who goes through a terrible ordeal and comes out the other end fixed. Um, and there's also the, the kind of, the deeper therapy, I guess, which, which makes things more comprehensible. And that's the kind of thing that I, that I would think a really good novel does. So something like, uh, like George Eliot's Middlemarch, for example, where you take two characters who in a normal novel would get together, have a courtship and get married. And they don't get together, they don't have a courtship, they don't get married. And it's what happens when two people marry the wrong person, live in the same community and recognize really one another but, but not romantically. It's, it's a wonderful thing and it's far more telling, I think, than any of her other novels. But yes, I think, I think literature can be very therapeutic. Apart from anything else, stepping out of your own miserable world into somebody else's miserable world. I mean, you can either think my world is less miserable or you can think <laughs> this is a nice world to occupy for a time. What about the impact of psychiatry and psychology on novels and vice versa? Um, uh, when people say what novels are meant to be about, they often say, particularly in publishing, that novels are about the human condition. Psychology and psychiatry are kind of sciences that are meant to be about the human condition as well, but seem to come at it a different way. Yet, if you go to university or academic common rooms uh, of psychology and psychiatry departments up and down the country, mm. I have to tell you, they're not usually discussing uh, the latest uh, novel. Um, so it has, it seems, they don't get their theories or their ideas from novels. Um, and and what, what do you think about the impact of, of the, the disciplines or fields on each other? Do you think, are, are novels or novelists influenced by what's happening in psychology and psychiatry? And novelists have always, I think, since, since uh, Freud wrote, people like Hardy, obviously people like Zola, were reading Freud and were learning from him and possibly disagreeing with him at times. And all the heirs of those two writers, and they're, 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 they have a huge progeny, um, have obviously got past that way. Uh, you would have imagined that Jung would have a huge impact on writers. He does on poets, but less so perhaps on novelists. But yes, I think there is quite a lot of interest amongst writers in psychology. Whether fiction is about the human condition or not, I don't know. Clearly psychiatry is. But the idea that there is a single human condition, uh, you know, that, that there is a single human character always seems to me questionable. And I think what literature is about is really about the human conditions, the very the huge diversity Whereas I suppose psychiatry and psychology are, while well, they're dealing with specific cases, are trying to relate them to general problems. And you've learned an awful lot from Greek drama, so, you know, you've got Electra complexes and Oedipus complexes, so you can't very well have, you know, Tristram Shandy complexes and things. So you've mentioned the Sylvia Plath syndrome, so that's, that's one step in the right direction. <laughs> the, the, the other thing about science is that it says that the way we find out about the world is we do things called experiments. And the whole power of an experiment is that whatever you may feel, whatever your prejudices may be, the experiment delivers a result which is meant to persuade you, mm. despite the fact you may not have agreed with um, the, 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 the view of the world that the experiment is, is showing us. Mm. And that's the, the advance of science is always that we overturn our views of the world because the experiment demonstrates we were wrong mm. with, with our analysis about whether um, the sun went round the earth and so on and so forth. Mm. Um, I, th I think the scientists are suspicious of art forms like the novel because they kind of say, how do we know it's a great book? How do we know it's a great novel? Because a bunch of people sit around and call the critics saying, it's a great story <laughs> and they're suspicious of that methodology do, do you think that there's something about a great novel that anyone reading it recognizes it in some way for what it is i think anyone with the skill to read and i, I underline that with the skill to read will relate to a great novel um, and if they can't read it on the page 
let me tell you, there's nothing more wonderful than a good audiobook. And I mean that. Uh, the way that I think a lot of people who don't read novels nowadays would get into them is through the audiobook. Some of the, the amazing readings of Edith Wharton or Henry James or anyone really, um, American Psycho, you know. Um, there are some amazing audiobooks out there. But on the page or off the page, the novel will, I think, compel, a good novel will compel the, the person who is able to read. But being able to read doesn't mean just being able to put words together and make us, you know, see a sentence. Being able to read means seeing language, seeing through language, seeing into what's behind it. Could you say a bit more about this? Because um, um, it, it's, it's a new idea to me that, you, that, that reading is a skill, or there's a, such a thing as being a good reader. Well, I think a reader who is satisfied with clichés is not really uh, engaging with, with the reality behind those clichés. Let me give you an example. When I, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I read a book called Exiles in the Kingdom, a translation of Camus' stories, which I absolutely adored. I thought it was the most wonderful book I'd read. I bought it again about 10 years ago, and I could not read it because the translation was so bad. Now, when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, I did not have the sense of quality of language. I did not have the sense of the way in which a sentence ought to be put together to, to work. Perhaps I become hyper-sophisticated or something and I can't read it, but I think I'm right not to be able to read it. I think that book needs a new translation. Um, I think a good reader, you, you become a good reader, you know, you grow as a reader. Sometimes when you're little you like whatever you like when you're little, when you're older you, you come to like Tolstoy. Or, and Marguerite Alaska always used to say to me, when you're young you like Madame Bovary, when you're older you like the sentimental education, that's for the grown-ups. Uh, and so with Flaubert, you, you know, there, there is, within, even within a, a writer's work, there's discrimination between the books you read when you're young and when you're old. Choosing the book's important, but I, I do believe very strongly that you develop as a reader, you develop your reading skills, and the more you read, uh, and I don't mean quantity, the more, the more you read in, if you like, the more... I spent ten years... I spent three years reading The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. I spent, I spent about eight years reading Proust. Uh, and I was, I was reading other things at the same time. But you do... you live in it, and, and it, you, you, know, you acquire skills that go with that reading. If I was at a dinner party and I met someone, would I be able to tell that they were one of these things you're referring to as a good reader or skilled reader, as opposed to uh, someone who isn't? You probably would. You'd probably listen to the way they talk, and you'd listen to the way in which they pause, and you'd listen to the way in which they construct a sentence. How do they dramatise their ideas? How do they... Yes, and, and what do their eyes do when they're talking to you? Do they look at you? Do they look away? Are they, are they as it were, pulling syntax out of the air? Are they actually... Engaged? There are all sorts of things which indicate, I think, a good... a potentially good reader. You can... I, yeah. <laughs> So, so we're running out of time. It's been a wonderful conversation. One, one final point I want to address is the psychological appetite we seem to have for story. We consume a huge number of stories almost on a daily basis. An advert is a small story. Hollywood is, a, is an industry that churns out stories over and over again. And of course, the novels, to some extent, are about stories. What, what are your thoughts about this appetite we seem to have for stories, to be told stories, to consume them. Well, also we make stories. I mean, even today, coming, coming here, walking desperately, rapidly from Houston, I passed two extremely beautiful people, and I was wondering who, you know, you, wondering leads to creating stories. You know, I was wondering where they were from, I was wondering what they did, and so on. I was also wondering whether I should turn around and follow them. <laughs> <laughs> well, lucky um, to go <laughs> you today, then. <laughs> so, anyway, what I'm trying to say is that we, we have a great hunger to... to to, to uh, receive narrative, but we also have this... We, we, we are unable not to tell ourselves story, stories about things we don't know. We make them familiar to ourselves by stories, you know. I'm trying to work out what that strange fountain is behind your head, for example. <laughs> well, this is interesting because in the, in the days where Freud was dominant within psychiatry, the patients came and told a story mm -hmm. of their lives. That's right. And the analyst was very interested in that story and, of course, reinterpreted it and told the story back, mm. a different story. Um, from the same material, and yeah. they kept telling each other stories, as it were, as the analysis yeah. continued. Mm. Uh, modern day psychiatry, which has embraced the biological approach and the notion that mentalness is about biochemistry or mm. disturbed biochemistry, we seem to have abandoned interest in the story of people's lives mm. and also hearing the story, trying to think about it, and then tell a story back. Um, 
And I, I wondered what your thoughts are about that, because it also seems to coincide with a moment in history where medical students seem much less interested in doing psychiatry than historically. They were in the mm -hmm. 60s when psychoanalysis was more dominant. It was, a, it was a, a, almost a popular specialty. Mm -hmm. um, but is there a sense in which um, the richness of storytelling, to, to lose it, means we're losing something pretty important about the human condition? Were it to be lost, I think you would be. And I'm shocked to hear that psychiatry has gone this way. I, mean, I didn't realize it was all about thermometers. I thought it was still about telling and telling, telling stories back and forth. Um, well, I think that's what it ought to yeah, be about. But I, I don't think we can abandon the biological findings. No, no, no. You must have a little bit of biology, certainly, <laughs> yes. But, uh, but I, I, do, I do feel that if it is the case, it would coincide with, in fiction, in experimental fiction in particular, the loss of an interesting character. Uh, which I think is unfortunate myself, but um, you know you can't really you can't really do much about it. There's a there are a series of wonderful novels by or two wonderful novels by by um, Donald Barthelme, which are basically a, about the dissolving character and the character dissolving in language. So um, yes, I, it, it, it's a, that's a very interesting observation of yours. I well, the other thing I would have to say as well is that we listen to the news and we hear stories. Politicians tell us stories. They tell us a story in order to sell us a war, mm. for example. Yes. And I think that the notion to spot a story, a good story, a yeah. gripping story, but yet still a story, yeah. is quite important. And um, we're manipulated through the storytelling of mm. our leaders. We are, and I think that is where we should become good readers. Because there, there were stories on the news this morning before I set out, which, which troubled me because they were too simple. They're far too simple. Uh, I mean, the characterization, for example, at the moment within the British and the American media of Islam is, I think, appalling. I mean, knowing a bit about Islam, having lived a period of time in that part of the world, you realize that you know, Islamic uh, state or whatever it's called is not Islam. And you, you know, you real. But in a curious way, it's, it happened in in Ireland as well during the during the troubles there. All all the a whole a whole group of very diverse people were tarred with the same kind of brush. I, I think the simplifications of journalism are one of the things that good fiction is sort of pitted against. So that's quite an important point, the demonization of the villain, the turning it into a pulp fiction mm. simple story, a cliché, which is the villain is all terrible, yeah. and therefore you can't enter a dialogue with them. Yeah. We seem to have an appetite then, the public at any rate, for a simple story with a, with a, a hero, a villain, and a simple plot. And these things are very dangerous, because life isn't like that. Well, life isn't like that, and I think good fiction isn't like that either. And I think this is why modern fiction is much more complex than it was before, because it's fighting against so many simplified fictions, you know, it, um, and so many strategies of storytelling. I think a lot of novelists become very tired of the well-told story. Yeah. Michael Schmidt, thank you very much indeed. The book is entitled The Novel, A Biography, and um, it's published, I think, by Harvard University That's Press. Right. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.